Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Activities for People Living at Home with Dementia. We are proud to offer this series with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and the United Way of Tarrant County. These programs are recorded and are made available for viewing through a YouTube channel for future use. I am your host for today. Our topic today is horse racing brought to us by Peggy Spear with the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. Boy, I can't wait to see what she's got to say about horse racing with this season of the year. Peggy, yes. talk about All horse right. Good morning, Miss Nancy. Hey, Nancy. <laughs> hey, Nancy. Good morning. All right. Are we seeing it? We yeah. are. Yeah. All right. So we're going to look, mostly it's all photographs. I thought we might have some prints in our collection, but it turns out we've got a lot of photographs, which makes sense given the, um, the topic. People could easily bring cameras um, to these events. But we're going to, before we're entering any racetrack, we're going to start with what is really revolutionized film, what mm -hmm. revolutionized the painting of horses. And we're going to look at this series um, taken by the photographer Edward Moybridge. So have any of you seen the, a version of these types of pictures before in the past? Yes. Steve, yeah, I've movie. seen this actual picture before. Oh, you have? It's a, yeah, very famous, very famous picture. Yeah, he's done several, several, several iterations of this. So he initially did the, um, he started doing these in 1878. So this is 1887. So this is many years into his, his discovery and um, notability on doing these. But what are, can you tell me kind of what we're, what we're seeing, what we're looking at, what's happening? Look at a time-lapse picture of a horse ru running. <laughs> exactly. What he did is I think if I remember right, Peggy, he set up numerous cameras along this track with trip wires. Mm -hmm. And as a host went by, it tripped each camera. Correct. And then as he developed them, he put them in a sequence to see what was happening with the horse. Oh, and he was the first good. one, I think, to prove that a horse, when it was running, was, could run with all four hoofs off the ground. Exactly. Exactly right. We don't, I don't even, you don't even need me anymore. Steve. Oh, sorry, <laughs> yes, you do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, you're yeah. exactly right. And um, so you can see here, this where my mouse is. This is the, the image where all four hooves are off the, um, the ground. And you're exactly right. The, the human eye was not able to make that distinction while it was watching a horse trot or gallop when and if all four hooves were off the ground. So before these photographs, artists of every medium, painting, drawing, you name it, would have either the horses almost in that hobby, hobble horse where all four hooves are splayed, the front are pointing back or forward, and then the back uh, legs are pointing to the rear so that it's kind of splayed out, or um, one hoof would always be on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that was just how artists depicted it was accepted and that's how it was. But then what Steve was saying, this revolutionized because he was able to capture that exact moment where all four hooves were off the ground. So this changed moving forward, how artists depicted horses on canvas, in drawings, you name it. And so for example, even Remington in our own collection, you could see that transition of horse legs and how that started happening um, with really notable artists. So what he would do is exactly right. In this instance, we had 12, he had 12 cameras set up and the breast of the horse or the leg of the horse is what would trip that wire that was attached to an electromagnetic circuit. And it, when it would pull, it would set that, it would trigger that shutter to, to capture the image. So it happened very quickly. Oh, say that again. So he could have just as easily have not captured the one with all four off. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And so it took, you know, there were all these claims that he had been doing them earlier than when we had the actual negatives of when it did come through. 
there are a lot of skeptics in the beginning that he was manipulating the film and he was trying to prove like, look at my negatives to, to people who knew how to work with film and develop film. I'm not manipulating my negatives. This is exactly how it's happening and I'm able, able to capture it. But a lot of those negatives don't exist or we can't find them. Um, so eventually, I, it was in um, July, I think of 1878, there were people there, they watched it all happen, they saw the negatives, and then almost instantaneously, this took, spread like wildfire, and, and overnight, mm -hmm. she changed the, the, the game. And so um, this, not this particular one, but um, the first one was at a racetrack at what is now Stanford University in California, in Palo Alto. And so, but he's, at one number I saw that said, He's taken over a hundred thousand <clears throat> photographs of humans and animals in locomotion. Wow. Mm. So, so Peggy, mm -hmm. is there a relationship between the, the head on pictures at the bottom and the frames that are in the top? He's got them corresponding numbers. So you can see there's six, five, four, and then down here, you've got six, five, four. So I think there were, you know, the, the 12 cameras lined up and then there was just one camera in the front just taking the same okay. number. Up. So you can see from two different angles what that positioning or that gate looks like. Okay. And so then what he did, which he invented, it's called the um, zoopraxiscope, which is all of the precursor to the zoetrope, which is when you would lay the images flat on the, the uh, what is it, the zoopraxiscope. And then the zoetrope, you have them um, in a circle and a drum upright, and you can spin it. And then that's what makes it kind of like a flip book. It makes it look like it's moving as if it were a, a motion picture. <clears throat> so that those inventions, his discovery is then what really started. Uh, it was an intermediate transition between the still life and then, um, or the stop motion and motion picture. So we can thank Ed Moybridge for it. All right, so we, we see our jockey here. He's not in any real race, but we, he's simulating what it would be like. Here we are, we're at the races here. And this says, going to the start. So what, what hits you first when you look at this photograph? Um, it's raining. It raining, yeah, it looks, I can't tell if it's raining or if these are parasols that women are using for the sun. Oh, okay. But it looks yeah, easy, rain also, easy like it could be. It could be just the dirt of the track. Yeah. Ah, okay, parasols. <laughs> Let mm -hmm. me revise that, parasols. <laughs> what else do we see? A uh, big crowd. Big crowd. You can see there are some cars, what looks like cars here, people parked here watching. And then we've got the grandstand. And I don't know what turn this is. It says going to the start. So it to me, it doesn't look like these horses are about to take their mark. It looks as if right. they're maybe on the second turn of the Right. Of the track. Yep. That's what that was. What was uh, interesting to me is that I couldn't find figure out how this related to going to the start, like, like the start of a race. Yeah. You know, when the, in, in in horse racing, you have to you have the the starting line and the finishing line, and right. they're the same. They're the same thing, but you you, you call them different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right, it, they're either going to the finish, or they're starting at the start. But the title doesn't indicate either, you know, yeah. it doesn't match up. Well, that's Stiglitz for you. Yep. <laughs> so this artist, we've, we've seen him before, Alfred Stieglitz. He, um, big, big, big photographer, big name photographer um, working out of New York. And he was married to Georgia <laughs> O'Keefe. It's that same person. And he was really... Um, very responsible for this idea of pictorialism. This, this, so we've talked about this style before, but this softening of the image through the photograph. It was meant 
to create a mood or or tell a kind of tell a story versus the document that the crisp lines the documentary style photography had often was used usually used for prior to this he was really trying to elevate um photography to a fine art and not an art of documentation. So what does this feel artistic to you? What elements in this photograph feel art, artsy versus, you know, uh, just a straight depiction of what's happening? Well, it's kind of a little bit, not blurry, but a little bit off. Mm -hmm. And it kind of almost reminds you of this is like a, just a Sunday afternoon. Yes. Well put. Oh, I know they wouldn't race on Sundays. Okay, at this day, day and age. But you're but you're getting to that idea of kind of a leisure activity. There's yeah, not yeah. there's not stressful. It, people are here for fun. The the post of what would be the grandstand um, pavilion, mm -hmm. I, it perfectly bisects the, the photograph. Yeah. Yes, it does. So it feels balanced. And then and you've you got the, the, the trunk of the trees that, that mirror that. Yes, mm -hmm. what a great observation. Yes, you've got, and then even the, the turn yeah. posts. The turn poles, poles, poles yeah. yes. And then in terms of the, you know, it's a black and white photograph, <laughs> you've, you've got these speckled dots of what these umbrella parasols are, which kind of match the staggering of the jockey's uniforms Mm -hmm. on on the track <clears throat> uh, I would say this is probably pretty close to the start because they're all still spread out yeah and it, it, they, they haven't like funneled in yeah they usually start bunching together the farther they go mm -hmm. you know uh, mm -hmm. on the race they don't spread out so much on the track I think you're right I think this is the first turn I think what he's representing is going to the, not just the very start of the race, but how they are perceiving, uh, I, I'm trying to express this, right? As the racers start, they're all jockeying for position. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it, it feels, cause typically, I, I, I think you're right. I think it is that, that, initial out of the gate because um, the the finish line, they would be thinner or the group mm -hmm. would be thinner and they would probably be in between the fourth turn and the first turn that that finish line is usually yeah. right in the middle of the grandstand, right. which we don't, we can't see any of the infield really. So it feels like it's right. They're getting, getting into their lanes. And, and <clears throat> Steve Blitz was always really interested in horses ever since he was a child. So this is, I, this isn't the Belmont. This is probably a racetrack somewhere on Long Island or right outside the city, but it's not, Belmont didn't open, the Belmont racetrack didn't open until 1905. So this isn't that racetrack, but it was most likely a, a race, a racetrack in the, the city area. And so this was something that this time in the country, people were looking for these types of, of things, whether it was going to the opera or, you know, things were ramping up, going to circuses or Cirque du Soleil's and burlesque shows. There was this interest in going to these types of events for the social outing, like Steve alluded to, the, the leisure, the fun of it. And so this feels like it would be a fun event. I don't know about you guys, but I would definitely love to be at something like this. You like going to a car race today yes mm -hmm. always turn left <laughs> or a motorcycle or something you know like that racing yeah and i grew up in the north and um steeple chases and horse races were because pimlico was in baltimore so horse racing was a big deal um mm -hmm. up where i grew up and then mm -hmm. belmont of course is in new york so that was you know another big horse racing did you ever go to a race peggy yeah, but we weren't we weren't the people in the grandstand. We were the people in the infield. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I ever saw a horse at the Preakness, but we were there. 
I'm taking a always, look at the parasols and a lot of them are scalloped. Yes. Fancy and scalloped. And right next to the camera, the men are all in either bowler hats or squash hats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Th uh, this does look like a Sunday outing. Very good observation on the clothing. Yeah. So, and it, so it's fancier. I mean, yeah. there, there seems to be a bit of, um, not clout, but a bit of, of importance to attending something like this. But <coughs> definitely if you're sitting here in the grandstands, you probably look nicer than maybe some of the people who just pulled up and parked outside the uh, track, which is a great segue into our next photograph by Edward Steichen. And so here, this is a steeplechase, so a different type of horse race, but a horse race nonetheless. And it's entitled Steeplechase Day Paris After the Races. So can you tell me what you see here? Looks like people are going to move around like the horses are already past them. Exactly, yeah. Because this was, that steeplechasing is like golf. You know, people are all over the course watching them, but you can't see the whole race from one spot. Right. Yes, really? but this in Paris, you know, each um, country kind of does their steeplechases a little different than the country next to them. So, you know, I'm not sure where this particular uh, track or it wasn't a track field was. So it, some of them are really, really big. And you're right. You only get to see part of it when the horses are in the area where you are. And then some of the, the steeplechase um, fields are very compact and it's more focused on the jumping versus the flat running. Yeah. But here you're right, there's movement and that's exactly what this artist was trying to capture. Kind of the 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 dynamic situation and event that was happening at the horse races. And granted we don't see the horses, the horses have probably already run. People's backs are to what would have been the horse field, you know, track. So you're right, horses are take second fiddle to what feels like is the, the social outing of the whole Right, day. the socialization of it, the, the gathering, yeah. the talking, you know, the, I'm sure the ladies are comparing fashion mm -hmm. as well as uh -huh. um, the horses, you know, probably fashion more than the horses. Yeah. Uh, that's, you're exactly right. That, then Steichen was so interested in this social, forum of um of the steeplechase because it was really like you go to be seen and you go to see and the backdrop are horses but it's not about the horses fort right. worth colonial is exactly like that as well yeah. yeah they used to get dressed up to the nines i don't oh, yeah. know much anymore or or less depending on what year you went <laughs> yes yes People like Colin Davis when he was married to Priscilla, yeah. Yeah. they would get all gussied up to go to, to to watch golf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are very few events, especially sporting events, that I can think of these days that people really turn out in. I mean, there is very much that social aspect, but it's not the way it once was. Where you know, even now, if you go to the the Derby people get really dressed up and, um, the, you know, Preakness and Belmont just because it is part of the Triple Crown, but it's only if you're in the grandstand. And then if you're in the yeah. infield, you're wearing jean shorts and a t-shirt or bathing suit top or whatever. I mean, yeah, it's, exactly. it's very, it, that's very much like car racing, the NASCAR racing. Where it's, <laughs> so it's these, look, like these people, people look like they're not only fashionable, but they look like they're, they're wealthy. It, mm -hmm. Yes. Ooh. And this was upper class for sure. Steichen and Stieglitz were worked together, were very good friends. So they, um, the photographer from the last picture and this photographer worked together and, and Steichen was in Paris uh, looking for, at this particular time he wasn't, but would go to Paris to find other artists to display in New York that were on the up and up, the avant-garde. And, um, when he wasn't working in that capacity, Steichen would be taking portraits of wealthy Americans that were expats or studying, you know, some for some reason abroad in Paris, which then introduced him to this society within Paris that he got to go to this event. 
and he writes about this particular photograph. I borrowed from a friend a German hand camera and made my first attempt at serious documentary reportage. I went to Longchamp races and found an extraordinarily dressed, um, and can't read my writing, something audience, obviously more interested in display and viewing the latest fashions than following the races. So you were exactly right, Steve. And um, that little camera, he was able to discreetly take photographs without people realizing that they were being photographed. So he is really able to pick up on that authentic feel of it feeling of it being, I, I mean, I imagine you hear a lot of voices. I imagine it's people kind of bumping into you. This mm -hmm. man walking into, into frame doesn't feel distracting. It feels to contribute to this, this notion of it being busy and hectic and, and social. And his hat is different from the man who's sitting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which also looks different from this man. From that yeah. one, yes. And the other man in the middle mm -hmm. there, yeah. Yeah. It feels um, very Eliza Doolittle at the races to me in this. <laughs> all the women gathering. So yeah, so this was um, another version of this pictorialism really showing, telling a story versus documenting history. While it is documenting history, there's, there's a, an artistic and beautiful feel to this. Peggy, right. can you say can, can you say something about the photogravure process and so how does that work? Okay, I'm gonna give it my best shot, but this process really confuses the heck out of me. It's a lot, it's done on a paper. The development um, is I think it's done on a metal sheet, and then it's or it's done on paper, on a tissue paper that is then transferred to a metal sheet mm. and it's a lot of um exposing exposing it to chemicals rinsing the chemicals off then having to it to set then rinsing it again it's a it's a very laborious process and the paper it develops on is very sensitive and delicate and then that's why you set it onto the metal so it preserves it doesn't tear mm -hmm. do they do they etch it into the metal or I don't believe so, no. It's all on photosensitive papers. So you know, they have, they have a process that's on metal that's actually they put a photosensitive uh, chemical onto mm -hmm. the metal and then they expose it with light, <laughs> almost like this, where they have images from either a negative or papers or something and they expose it with light and it leaves the image onto the metal. Yeah, that might, and that might be another version of a photogravure. This process is very confusing to me, but I know it's very time consuming. And the reason that photo, that artists were using this development method was because it put the artist's hand into the development, which was yeah. part of what Steichen and Stieglitz were doing is really elevating the, the process of photography to include, to obviously show the artist's hand. Whereas in the past, it had just been very mechanical. Um, it, you know, you were agitating something to develop, but this really allowed the artist to make um, artistic choices in terms of mm -hmm. the development process. All right, we've got one more. All right. And this, a little more straightforward than the other ones we were looking at. So does this feel as fancy or as a little more run of the mill than the this other This looks ones? like a state fair. State yeah, fair? It does. Yeah, it does look like a state fair. Yeah. Um, and this looks like they might be taking their mark or trotting towards, you know, sometimes when the horses are being introduced, they might do a little right, yeah. pomp and circumstance before, but this does not feel mid-race. No, it's not. It's not in a race itself. It's actually the pre, I think yeah. the pre-race. Yeah, probably getting ready, getting, trying to get them lined up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can see, yeah, the, the jockeys are all upright. They're not bent forward. It feels kind of the calm before what might happen. Yeah. 
And and what do you notice about the people standing here? What about how they're dressed? How is they're, that different or similar to what we've seen in the other photographs? These these people look like they're uh, working people. Mm -hmm. What makes you say that? Middle class. Say that again. Is it middle class? Yeah, uh, probably. Not many of them wearing jackets. No, you're right. <coughs> It there's seems no they're there. Oh, it's a black and white. There's not a lot of color. Exactly. No. Yeah. Not much check texture or detail. Now, even the, the, the women's hats are dark, even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's only a couple women's hats. Yeah. There. One, two. There's a one to the left there of you where your cursor is. There it, where I'm not sure I'm seeing it. See the tall, okay, where you are, there, right, right there. Right there. there. Here? Yeah, no, up above, just above. There. there. And it's that actually one? a man. That's man? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the woman's hats are the typically the wider brimmed. Well, it could look kind of wider brim because of the the at least in our perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and she did um in this, she took a bunch of photographs. Uh, Clara Sipral was Canadian, moved down to Buffalo, New York, and then from Buffalo, New York, moved down to New York City. Um, so this is again probably another racetrack, and then eventually moved up to Vermont. So this is another north northeast racetrack somewhere. Mm -hmm. But she um in this series of photographs that she took, there um are mm -hmm. images of men and women gambling and exchanging money mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that. So she was really focusing on the, the gambling aspect of the ponies versus the social act, and which is social, mm -hmm. but not the elitist feel yeah. that we might have gotten from the other couple of photographs. I think as Don said, it's more like a county fair. It's more of a smaller track. Yeah, It's mm -hmm. not a yeah. big one. Not um, in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna to have to leave. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Peggy. Hey, tomorrow, yes, Steve. Steve. Good night. I love you. Ten o'clock we'll tomorrow. See you folks tomorrow. Ten o'clock tomorrow. Ten. Yep, ten o'clock. Okay. Yeah. So she um, and this particular photographer. So Claire Sipple was well known in her day. She took um, while we're seeing here what kind of feels like a a lifescape event. She was really known for taking portraits of famous people. So portraits of Einstein, Stieglitz, other notable actors and politicians of the day. So this <coughs> isn't what put her on the map, so to speak, but she had a lot of these photographs in her collection. And she was the first female artist um, to enter the MoMA collection in New York City. So she was, she was doing good things. Um, in her day and was no and had the recognition for it as well. All right, well, those are my horse pictures for the day. We've got the Belmont um, stakes are happening this Friday. I think the race is between four and five. It's usually on Saturday, so I don't know why they moved it this year, but that will be the third jewel in the Triple Crown. So I hope you enjoy some racing this weekend. And next week we're back with the topic Father's Day or Fathers for Father's Day. So, yay. We will be looking at pictures of dads in our collection. Peggy, this is always more fun than we think it's going to be. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Sometimes I don't know where we're going, but we all get where we're going together. So, I'm glad you're all here and I hope you have a really good week. I hope you had a good holiday weekend and I'll see y'all next Wednesday. Bye bye. Bye, Miss Peggy. Bye, Peggy. Bye. 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 Hold on. Wow. <clears throat> Janine, are you awake? <laughs> I shouldn't even ask. <laughs> okay, Bye, Don. Everybody. I okay to Don, for tomorrow, starting at 10 o'clock tomorrow with a different login that Gail's going to send to you. Memories International, we're doing another jukebox days. Anything y'all want to ask about that? No, it's the same sort of thing we had uh, um, last time. I think it'll be great. Yes, we were going to have Night at the Oscars, and then they decided to add this third country. Mm -hmm. And evidently, the Oscars wasn't going to track well with that third country. I don't know, but they decided to change it 
the guys that are doing this for free. Hush. <laughs> Said they were going to do jukebox plays again. So. Okay. Well, hush. <laughs> Got an opinion today. I think he does. <laughs> it's kind of like you said yeah, about yesterday, herding cats. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, um, the and guys came in in the, in the middle to do extermination. Oh. And he was dive bombing both of them. Oh, no. <laughs> Gosh, that hurts, they said. <laughs> Have I shared with you guys my Blanton's horse race? I don't no. think so, Phil. Tell us. <laughs> tell us, tell us. He's going to gonna He's stay gonna Oh, Nancy's already <laughs> skipped out. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, why don't we take off the recording and start our uh, Fifth Street Cafe? Okay. <laughs>